Good morning. Welcome to Scorpio Bible Fellowship. Our desire is to look at the scriptures from God's point of view. He wrote it with a purpose to draw us nearer to him. And so we um, hope that we would have a uh, good focus on the idea of Thanksgiving. I'm going to look at a little word, a little word study I've done before, but just a good reminder. Um, shall we pause for prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to the throne of grace knowing that we are in desperate need because we have nothing to barter with. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good and no, not one. So from your point of view, your view of mankind is totally different than ours. Uh, we make efforts at doing good things, but they're flawed. We don't have a complete understanding of the big picture. And so you and your grace, undeserved favor, displayed the most gracious thing in sending your son to become a human being to be a 200% be not only the God of the universe that created everything, but that you would send your son to become a man that he might take our place of condemnation and have the sins of the whole world poured out on him at Mount Calvary. And we thank you so much that not only did he die for our sins and took care of them completely, but he was buried and rose again victorious in providing us so much more by your grace to walk with you and spend eternity with you. So we uh, just pray that you would help us as we would just review some scriptures uh, that our hearts might be warmed to a heavenly value of life. In Christ's name, amen. Okay. There we go. Okay, here up a diagram on the board. When a person responds to the gospel, we're responding to something God did. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons sharing one quality of being God. In a moment of time, well, actually before our time was even considered, before the foundation of the world planned a plan. The Father is the planner, the Son is the executor of that plan, and the Holy Spirit is the illuminator of that plan. And so there's a sanctifying work going on in this room right now. The Spirit of God is working with your human spirit, trying to get your attention. Are you saying yes? Yes, I want to get, I want to understand something that you're trying to prod me about. Each one of us have a different life situation, and God has provided that. But in a moment of time, you believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins.
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 3 and 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you stand. It's important. There's a receiving, and there is a positional provision for standing. Verse 3, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. We don't pay for our sins. We can't. We're bankrupt. We have nothing to negotiate with God about our sin. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did the loving and God did the caring. God is the one that reached out and provided a means of salvation. Otherwise, we would have no salvation. There would be a horrible future for the whole human race. Verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He was victorious over death, and he has gone to heaven, he ascended to heaven, and as uh, providing us at this very hour a supporting gathering of truths that are going to be helpful to us in our walk. Here. I love this verse, Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it for it is the power of God to salvation. Salvation comes in three phases. The, per the moment we believe the gospel that Christ died, you give up on your own work system and you are totally dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for you, that he took care of the sin question and made it the son question. He that hath the son hath life. And salvation from condemnation happened just like that. No more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And then the door was opened to a, no, a brand new, not blind, brand new relationship that of our being children of God, being in, right in the right hand of the fa of Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a blessed position and God wants to communicate with us through his word. And the spirit of God is trying to draw us to different points of truth as we uh, gather together around his word. First John 5.13 these things have I written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God. When you see this word name, we're looking at it today. It, it, oh, so what's the name of this thing right here? What's this called? Abel. This is a computer. It has a name. It has characteristics. So when you say the word table, you envision a flat surface, legs, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ is in his name, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is God. Jesus means he's Savior. He's the only Savior. We don't help God out. He helps us. Number three, Christ is a word des describing the Messiah. The promised one of Old Testament scriptures. You believed in this, the name of the Son of God that you may K N O W not guess, not wonder. Why? Because it's not you doing the work. He did the work. So what's there left to do? But believe and trust in His provided salvation. 
So then the person who has believed the gospel, we might look at our notes for today. All right. My challenge to you is have a thankful Thanksgiving. Right. What's interesting is the Greek language. We operate in English, but there there's a parallel there. But I I like to bring out the use of the Greek at times. Thanks and grace, two words. And you would think that they are very distinctly different. But they come from the same root. In the New Testament, the word for thanksgiving and grace are closely related. Think about it. When we give graciously, When we give graciously thanks to others because they did a gracious act for us. So when we, when someone was opening the door for me, you know, and I was hauling stuff in from the car, I don't know if I said thank you, but I probably should have, but didn't. Right? Someone did a gracious act. The non-meritorious, they didn't have to do it. And so the natural response to grace should be thank you. Doesn't that make sense? So we have many things to thank God for. But I think the greatest is grace itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. So this is the verse that stimulated me on this journey. I thank. Your car is crystal. Literally, good grace. That's what we're, if you just took the literal meaning, it's two words. The E-N part of it is good, and charis is grace. I have it underlined there, that part of the word. And it has an attitude, it, it talks about a response, a gratitude for something that has taken place. I thank my God. I say to my God, good grace, God. Thank you for that. And then the Apostle Paul said, always concerning you at Corinth, those of you believers, for the grace of Charis, the unmerited favor of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ. The means of delivery was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son becoming a human to become one out of us, one of us that he might take our place in judgment and provide a relationship with God that's very special. We are joined, our human spirit is joined to his human spirit. First Corinthians chapter 6 talks about that. And he was challenging them, said, well, boy, don't join your human spirit to anything else when you're, you're, you're connected to God. Why don't you be enjoying him, enjoying to him in your everyday walk and activities? This reminded me of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace 
unmerited favor, favor you did not deserve, you have been saved. Notice it's not say you will be saved someday. It says you have been saved. So these people at Ephesus, they have believed the gospel that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. And so he got to say, uh, looked at them as being in Christ, no longer in Adam, a uniquely different people, citizens of heaven, special. For by grace, God's unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith in what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So my faith is in his finished work. And that not of yourselves, it's not something you conjured up. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. No one will be able to boast that I contributed something to my salvation. That would be wrong. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now we don't work for salvation, but God's grace works in us to do good works. After we're saved, we are his workmanship created when the moment we were we entered into move from being in Adam to being in Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by the placing of the Holy Spirit of us in Christ, connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, the head, we are his body. In that moment of time, we were made was made available the ability to do good works. And what's interesting, which God has, God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God who knows everything anticipated that. And he's got your whole life filled with opportunities for you to do his will. And if you're being thankful, it really helps because you're on the you're saying good grace. I see that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And if we realize that God is gracing us as for a purpose of good works, there are opportunities for us around us to do the will of God. One of the verses I didn't use was 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which points out that uh, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning him. There's a lot of good, uh, Thanksgiving verses. And so I had a lot to choose from. I only picked a few. But I think we need to have this mental foundation. We can easily forget what we're saying thankful for. We, you know, uh, you go to the uh, a restaurant and the, 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 the words that are used, they're supposed to be nice to you. They're supposed to be nice to you. They have the person serving the food that you've ordered and uh, you thank you thank them for doing that and it, it can that word gets to be not worth too much in our in our experience we need to uh, give it this proper value in the Christian walk that we're thanking God for a grace. 
Point number two, grace and standing. When one trusts the gospel of Christ, one is declared righteous. That word is in the English is the word justified, declared righteous. It's not that you are righteous in your own standing, but God has made a declaration because you're in Christ. You are as righteous as God is righteous. Positionally, not in practice, in your position. And that's why you can be accepted into the body of Christ is because God made you perfectly righteous. For he, God the Father, hath made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, emphasize this truth that God has given us a standing of grace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith. What does it say? Into this grace in which we stand. We stand there already, but he's the one that wants us to use this position. We, can, we have access by faith, to walk by faith by trusting God with our everyday activities. We are pleasing to God. We are, because we're using his grace and the favors he's showering upon us in our position in him and rejoice in hope. Uh, many times we use the word hope in English as wishful thinking, but what, what the actual meaning of the word is as expectation. And so let's put that in the verse through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in expectation of the glory of God. We can bring glory to God by using his grace. Our position is a grace position. Lewis Barry Schaefer wrote a book about the 33 things that we have in Christ. First Peter chapter 5, verse 12. By This is at the end, end of the letter, and so he's explaining something. Uh, Sylvanus is mentioned by the Apostle Peter. By means through. He did the writing for Peter. And so he's talking about thinking um, and, and giving recognition to Sylvanus um, Peter was a, a Jew, and I'm sure he didn't uh, write Greek very well. And so he would dictate to a writer that would write it for him. And Sylvanus, fellow believer, uh, Our faithful brother, as I firmly consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, which 
in which you stand. Let's turn to our Bibles here, to the fifth chapter of First Peter. There you go. First Peter, chapter five, picking it up in verse five. First Peter, chapter five. Verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And then notice this carefully. For God resists the proud. Our humbling ourselves before God and saying thank you is a very healthy thing for us. Recognizing God's dealing and providing you in your everyday activities are, are very health, healthy for our mind, our outlook. For God resists the proud. Uh, the world likes pride and arrogance. God doesn't. And so you're going to get resistance from God if you operate that way. But before God, if we're humble, he will give you grace. but gives grace to the humble. The, the very gracious things we need to, to function in life. So therefore, humble yourselves. This is the smart thing to do. <laughs> under the mighty hand of God. God's able. He's powerful. All powerful. Nothing can stop him hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And he can't be overloaded. So he says, go ahead, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that your same, the same sufferings are experienced for your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, unmerited favor, who calls, called us by his eternal glory, by Jesus Christ. That's how we got saved. After you suffer a while, perfect or complete you, establish you on a foundation, strengthen you so that you have something structural on that foundation and settle you. It fits into what's going on all around you. So he's going to want to organize you. <laughs> you need organizing. I need organizing. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. By Savinius, our faithful brother, as I considered him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God 
in which you stand. Let me do that again. Okay. Number three, grace and ministry. Each believer is given a gift of ministry in the body of Christ. The moment they get saved, they each are given one. Christ will is, each is God God. God's will is, there should be a positive PS there. God's will is that we, that we each does his will, which causes the right actions. Romans chapter 15, verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. The Lord is going to give us things to say, things to do by his grace and to give it and to use it to be gracious to others in the process. 1 Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. What if Paul kept us a secret? We would not have 1 Corinthians 3.10 and following and talking about the judgment seat of Christ. So when we <laughs> look back from letting God's grace flow through us, not only are we shortchanged, but we're shortchanging other people. So thank, saying thank you, recognizing this grace is correct, or it's not only correct, but it is very needful for ministry. We're to be used of him to be helping in the body of Christ Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. That's a very good portion. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Well, we're going to be covering some of this later anyway. But, uh, verse, well, verse 13, the edifying of the body. All right, let's go. The, the purpose of the, today, there's a passive teacher gifts. Equipping, that's a, uh, that the man needs to have that gift because God is, wants to use him in that capacity. So each one of us are gift, gifted differently. Till we all come to unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, complete man, in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. And that word... Napios means 
and a, a child that kid is unable to speak yet. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. If you don't uh, get yourself grounded in the word of God, in the grace of God, the whole message of the New Testament is a grace message. It's God giving you something that you didn't deserve. And if you're not tying into that and plugging into that, then your life is worthless. And when it, and you come to judge the seat of Christ, when, when your works are evaluated, you get a goose egg for that time because you didn't do it by grace. You were proud and you said, I, I, I know what to do. You just run off and do your own thing and it may quote unquote work out. It looks good, but you didn't do it God's way. But when you're walking in the spirit, you're willing to be interrupted by God and say, God, you should do this as well. Pause here. Take the time for this. Whatever the situation might be. If you put yourself in that condition, the opportunities to talk to other people are often produced because you've got grace thinking on a merited favor. So what the Lord is teaching you what the Lord is showing you, he's going to give you opportunity with fellow believers to share. We should share that. Why? What does he say? But speaking. That means a choice is involved. But speaking the truth in a correct way, in love, may grow up in all things into him. That helps you to grow in grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The head, Christ. From whom the whole body join and knit together by what every joint supplies. Each of us contributes something a little bit different. And that's good for us. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself. Edification, I can teach you. You have a class every day. If you don't allow the grace of God to be applied, there is no building up of the body of Christ. I contribute to that building by sharing what the Lord's working with me on and applying these things in my life. This is what we're all called to. Chapter 4, verse 7. Go back here now. What I want you to notice is verse 7 here. <laughs> but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then we have here injected an Old Testament prophecy 
Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, that was predict a prediction about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he ascended on high, he led captivities captive. And that was a quite good question of what captives would be in Abraham's bosom would be there. That's where the Lord Jesus Christ went when after he died was it, and was buried. Okay. When he died, his human spirit and soul went to Sheol. To Abraham's book in my place of comfort for Old Testament saints. And he led captivity, these that were captive. After he took them and he moved them from Sheol because he had paid for their sins, they could be now elevated and they're in heaven right now. At the same time, after his ascension, what happened? He gave gifts to men. So it was after the ascension that this took place. Chapter 4, verse 9, now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. This is called in other places, Abraham's bosom. Verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, So he went to the third heavens and brought all those people with him. And he himself gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastor teachers for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of their ministry. for the edifying of the body of Christ. All right, let's go to notes again. Read it again now. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, that's Christ's ascension, he led captivity captive, Old Testament saints from Abraham's bosom to heaven, and gave gifts to men. Christ, after his ascension to heaven. Verse 9, go on the back page. And now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended, is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, <clears throat> that he might fill all things. And that means be fulfill all things, this idea of, it, of fulfillment. Verse 11, and he gave it some apostles some prophets, they provide the New Testament. Those gifted men provided that there was only one foundation for the church and the, the apostles and prophets did the uh, providing of New Testament doctrine, the New Testament. Some evangelists, that's a missionary, and pastors and teachers, that's a, a, a uh, individual with two gifts. He can shepherd and teach. These two equipped gifts still live today, are given today. Verse 12, gifts for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry of the other gifts 
for the result of edifying the body of Christ. Point number four, grace and conduct. The Apostle Paul claimed that receiving the supernatural grace of God had an effect on his conscience. So we have a bit in our mind, a standard of right and wrong. So things get changed in our standard of what we think is right and what we think is wrong. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 12. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conduct ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. So I said our conduct got changed because we're thinking differently. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our head, to him be the glory both now and forever, amen. Number five, his grace for us. We live in the dispensation of grace. This time is being a time of emphasis upon the grace of God. And if you want to read that, some more about that, uh, chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 1 through 7, it's a good review on that. God graced us that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So our future has something special involved that what we have used of the grace of God, every time we use and practiced thank you God, <laughs> Being thankful every time we responded to the grace of God as we have humbled ourselves before God and said, I know I don't know how to do it right. I just don't know how to do it right. I can wish I was doing it right, but I just need to be led, be led by you through those situations and those circumstances. And the Spirit of God will bring the verses to mind. But you got to spend time in the Word so the Spirit of God can take, bring the verses to mind that fit. And I enjoy having conversation with uh, believers. And it's, a, it's like the Lord pointed out a verse for them to, to challenge their thinking and and boom, here's a situation where it applied in their life. It fit. Number six, so, let every, so let's give thanks for his good grace. Here are a few of our thanks, uh, many thanks that we could have put, out, put here, but just a few. Ephesians chapter five, verses 19 and 20. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks. How often? Always. Always. For all things. To God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.12 giving thanks to God who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. We don't deserve it. He qualifies us. The inheritance of the saints in the light. So in Colossians 3, 17, and whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name, in the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's befitting our head. 
giving thanks to God and the Father through him. And finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. That's pretty often. <laughs> without ceasing. So this is not something to use occasionally. All the time. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Here's the attitude that happens. I like this verse. It's the attitude. You welcomed it, not as the word of men. Holy men spake. They spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Bible we have has been given to us by God, working in the heart of special people to provide us the Old and New Testament. It's not the word of men, but as is, it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. And it works, that's what's cool. That's what makes it special. Here we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God, which is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing us apart our human spirit and our soul. It critiques our thoughts and intents. Father, we need your grace. We need to appreciate your grace. We need to see it in our lives. Show us you, your being gracious to us. Remind us and help us then to respond with a thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.